than you would in the upper zone. So that opens things up even more interesting. Okay, so uh, this one is not our final talk of the day, but it's our final LL4D talk, and also our final student uh, of the conference. So uh, Tom Buckle is going to give the next talk. Thank you, Dave. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tom. A um, bit of a change in pace. I'm going to be talking about basically using machine learning to um, predict some stuff from PXRF data. My supervisor, Hannah, said, oh, one thing I like about machine learning talks is when they nicely explain the models being used and it's not just presented as a black box, you don't move on very quick from that. Uh, and she looked at me and said, I'm sure you've done that, haven't you, Tom? This was like yesterday. I said, yeah, of course I have, Hannah. Of course. Um, I haven't. <laughs> but she's not actually here. She had to leave early, so that's quite good. Um, so moving on from that, let's dive straight in. So um, scanning of core, whether it's, well, there's various technologies now, but PXREF scanners become quite popular, pretty routinely used. And certainly at Anglo, um, they're collecting a lot of PXREF data um, on their whole core as soon as it's been drilled. Um, and that's great because you end up with a really big, useful data set. Um, but on the flip side, it's a bit challenging because you've got this really big data set that you need to do something with, and it's not always easy to sort of wade through all the data, especially, I think, with PXREF data, because in time, after you've got your lab assays back or you've done some more analysis, you're probably going to get some better quality data. It might not be as high resolution in terms of the amount of points you get, um, but it's kind of like there's a time-limited value to this data. So my thought is that we should try and uh, do some stuff to this data to make it a little bit more interpretable, perhaps. So what I'm going to present today is a way that we can try and predict a lithology log directly from the um, PXREF data. Um, and also where we have the right data available, um, and this is in the critical zone, um, predict pyroxene species and, and relative abundance. Um, that part, the min mineralogy part, is a little bit of an afterthought. So I'll mainly be focusing on the lithology part uh, in the talk today. Let me just get this pointer. Okay, in the world of machine learning, they seem to like doing competitions. Um, and there was one for lithology classification from machine learning of um, predicting lithology from wireline logs um, back in 2017. It was written up in a nice little paper. And this diagram from the paper just shows the, prog the progression of all the different teams over time, how they got better. Um, and there's a few interesting things that we can learn from looking at this competition. But one thing was that the three top teams all use the same type of model, and that's gradient boosted decision trees. Um, so this is where my beautiful explanation of gradient boosted decision trees goes in for Hannah. Um, but basically, using that information, it, it's not an it's not um, unexpected that these types of models have worked for this type of problem. Um, they've been shown to be quite robust across a wide range of of uh, tasks, um, and even actually some of these other teams that didn't quite make it, they're using random forests, which is another type of ensemble decision tree based method. So decision trees seem to be a good approach. So let's try that, shall we? So take our um, PXRF data, take our logged human logged lithology as our training labels, um, and then try and predict it from each PXRF point. And we get something that's okay. It's not terrible, but you can see it's not great. Um, we can see we're kind of predicting a bit too much Luca gabbronorite generally in, in, in the main zone up here than uh, what's been logged as a northosite, although it might not be right. Um, but the main challenge, I think, with these sorts of problems, and the bit I'm going to focus on is, is this issue where we've got a lot of noise in the log. And if we think about it, that's probably not too um, unexpected when we're logging we like to not just consider a tiny slither of core, we take it in context with you know, an interval and we kind of smooth out the noise mentally um, on, you know, we kind of ignore things which might not be relevant to the scale of logging that we're doing. Um, and if we go back to more of these competitions, there's another rerun of this competition in 2020, both of these competitions, they found a similar thing. The, the key thing that you need to do if you really want to step up um, and improve your prediction is to augment your samples with extra information about the samples around it, um, which is what you do mentally when you're logging, right? Um, and this is known as feature engineering, and it's well known, again, um, out in all of data science that, you know, feature engineering, adding in extra features is really where you'll get a step change in performance or 
I say a step change, you know, a, a, a decent improvement. Um, and I think this is also really obvious when we think about what we're actually gathering. We're doing P PX ref uh, straight on the core. If we're doing something that's quite fine grained, both of our samples are going to be fairly similar within an interval. Um, something a bit more coarse, obviously, we take two samples there, it's going to be quite a, a variance between those two samples. Um, and then, not to mention, we've got other little features that may be sampled when they're not really relevant to that wider interval that we're interested in. So, let's have a little drink. Always get a very dry mouth. Um, so, what can we do? What, what sort of features can we engineer um, to try and improve our prediction? I'm going to take you through my kind of thought pattern, um, a simplified case of how I thought about it. Um, so we're going to think about it in, in one dimension. We've got this imaginary bit of core. Go through, take some PXREF samples. And then handily, we've got this one output from PXREF, which perfectly describes or can perfectly describe our lithologies. So if we kind of take where the, that um, output from PXREF falls in these bands and then classify our samples, we're going to get a pretty good guess at what the what the rock type is, right? But because of the noise, this whole issue that we're just saying, it's going to be noisy. We're going to have some misclassifications. So how can we deal with this? Well, one approach, and, and actually one approach which is quite common in uh, time series machine learning problems, um, and what is a downhole log, if not a time series of geological time, um, is to use a moving window of a certain size, or maybe a few different sizes, but certainly a fixed size, slide it along, average out the signal, and use that as, as some extra data. So in this little simplistic case, we're going to imagine we make a prediction just using that, that trace. And it's kind of going to improve the situation in one way, in that we smooth out that noise, and internally to these intervals, we're going to make better predictions, hopefully, in theory. This is just like a thought experiment. This isn't like actually what happens. But um, on the boundaries, we're going to now have a problem because we've smoothed these boundaries we're going to make, have some misclassifications in the boundaries, or in the case of this like thinner granite feature here, we, we're going to miss it completely because we've used a wide window for our averaging. Um, so it, in an ideal world, what we'd like to do is change this windowing size based on the sort of interval that we're interested in. And we'd have this variable size window where it's kind of where these windows align to the intervals, sort of the geological intervals. Uh, average data within them, and then all of a sudden we've got a perfect prediction, ideally. It so happens, so the, the question is, how do we choose this window size and how do we place these boundaries? And there's a very nice method, which is um, called the continuous wavelet transform. It got a small mention in Sue Webb's talk. Um, she showed a scalar gram. They're quite hard to interpret. Maybe Sue finds them right. I'm not sure, <laughs> but they're, they're quite hard to interpret. But there's a really nice paper from uh, some people at, people at BITS, uh, Cooper and Cowan, 2009. They used two types of wavelet transform to identify boundaries and boundary strengths. Um, so basically, you, you, you get your, your downhole trace. And you can convert it into this plot, which this was this extra piece, this tessellation diagram, was done by June Hill at CSIRO, this piece of work. Um, published there if you want to check it out it's very nice and you produce these nice tessellation plots and they describe boundaries and intervals in your data across multiple scales of observation so the further a feature is across to here on the right the stronger that boundary so this boundary extends quite far because this is quite a significant change in this downhole trace this is like a smaller feature so it's, it's been picked out but it's not quite as significant um, so that's the method so how can we use this in like machine learning to, to augment our data. So the approach that I took, um, and there's various ways we could have done this, but I decided to take this approach, um, was to essentially, for want of a better word, discretize this wavelet tessellation diagram. Um, so essentially we can we can we can result get the output as like a, a table of data where we have our original sample values. Um, for every sample that we've taken with our PXREF, and then an e extra column for each one of these scales where within that interval, we've taken the mean of, of the downhill trace. 
Um, so the, the resulting number of features is equal to your number of input variables. So if, say we've got 20 elements or 20, yeah, well, 20 elements um, that we're using, and then we extract 10 scales, we'll end up with 200 features as opposed to 20 features. Um, now, arguably, that might be too many features, but one benefit of these, well, the model that I'm using, XG Boost Gradient um, Boosted Decision Tree, is it's quite good at selecting the relevant features and just disregard, disregarding the others. It's not necessarily an efficient way of doing it because you increase the amount of time you need to train the model. But if time's not a problem, um, you can kind of put, the, put all these variables in and it will sort itself out. So, um, good to know. How can this, like, I've got a little visualization of how this can maybe help this approach of discretizing the data and, and kind of appending these mean values back to the original data can, can help split apart um, our features. So we plot the sample scale, aluminium versus magnesium, and just for pyroxenites and anorthosites in our holes. We can see that there's a bit of an overlap there. So obviously we're going to be using more than just uh, magnesium aluminium, but this is again a bit of a thought experiment, but in two dimensions now. We, we've got an overlap of our data and we're not going to be able to separate these two features out. If we plot the same samples, so there's actually the same number of points on this plot, but they've kind of been pulled together and clustered together. Pl plot them at an increased scale, the mean values of these intervals, um, you can see that we start getting a lot better separation of our north site and peroxinite. So that's how inclusion of these kind of higher level scales can help us tease apart our different rock types. So how did this all feed into the model? So do the feature engineering steps, split the data by whole. And um, that's a really important, this is a little side note. Um, if you're in the business of machine learning and you're splitting your data as you do into your testing and training data sets, and you've included spatial features on back onto your samples, you need to be really careful that you only you, you separate them by whole because now samples within a whole have information about the other samples around them. So you can have a situation where you leak, it's called data leakage, you leak information from your testing set into your training set and you can get really great results. And I got really great results. I was ecstatic, but it was not right because information had leaked from my training and testing data set. I'm not sure if I've explained that very well, but talk to me if you want to know more. It also includes if you do a cross validation process, you also need to group them by whole. Um, so train the model, let's have a look at the results. So what we have here is two holes out of many, but um, I've cherry picked some nice ones. Um, <laughs> don't worry, I've got some bad ones next. Um, and we've got the, the log stratigraphy, we've got the prediction with the engineering features and the prediction without the engineering features. So the first elephant in the room is that my prediction is over predicting Luca Gavin all right, or it's, it's generally more um, sort of on the, so less felspathic side of things. Um, not entirely sure what that is right now. But anyway, moving on from that, if you just take the general trend, um, I think it's pretty good. We're picking out this um, poikolytic anorthosite quite nicely at the bottom. We lose a bit of detail in the critical zone. That's a bit of a shame. Um, but the fabulously interesting main zone is quite well defined. Um, <laughs> Hopefully you will you would appreciate though that the particularly in the main zone, this this noise issue is 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 a bit annoying in the where we've only got the sample prediction. And also we've got things being predicted as pyroxenites or felspathic pyroxenite pyroxenites, which aren't existing in the logging. These are the less good ones. They're still okay, but they're not great. Um but still useful. And I am also trying to predict every log lithology type. I did do a bit of simplification, but there's like even more than I've shown here quite a complex problem. Maybe I should simplify it down and start again and just do a, a more simplified log. Finally, I did mention the mineralogy part. If you repeat the whole thing, but instead of using a classification algorithm, Dave's prowling, um, and you use a regression algorithm, use the hyperspectral imagery or hyperspectral mineralogy, sorry, as your labeled data where you have it, it turns out you can quite nicely predict orthopyroxene and clinoproxene abundance directly from the PXRF. In this case, that whole convoluted feature engineering step doesn't actually increase the performance very much, maybe like by a percent. Um, but particularly the, uh, when, you, when you look at the ratio between OPX and CPX, so this is from the hyperspectral data, this is then my prediction. Um, it works really well for picking out 
where you have OPX dominance versus CPX dominance downhill. Oh, that's another one, but yeah, I think we get the point. So that's the conclusion. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you to Anglo for funding the conclusion. Okay, time for one question, Bruce. Have you gone back and looked at the logs again afterwards with what your machine yeah. learning is suggesting to see with how much the original logging might have been incorrect? No, but that is obviously something that would be really